Yeah, it bounced the floor. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's get going. This is the uh, last lecture, and actually to start, uh, I've decided to skip spinal reflexes. You don't have to know it. So I'm going to skip all the way to here. So what you can do is, uh, what I'll do is I'll post um, the study guide and I'll cross out all the ones that I'm not covering. So you have an idea on the study guide of what I skip. Let's, let's talk about the ear. Start off with a picture of the temporal bone, and it shows you how the inner ear structure, which we'll spend the most time talking about today, is inside the temporal bone. Yeah, in this picture here. So here you look at a cranial base view of the petrous region. You can kind of see how the cranial nerve, uh, what's well cranial nerve 8 <coughs> that innervates the inner ear structure? Okay. Now, cranial nerve 8, we're going to look at both the uh, cochlear branch for audition or hearing, and we're going to look at the vestibular branch. for balance and equilibrium. That's what I said before in the cranial nerve lecture, but we'll be more detailed today. So here's kind of a classic picture of the ear, and we have many models in the room for ear, and I know you're not being tested on the models, but it's still advisable to study the three-dimensional model so the two-dimensional pictures make more sense. This is a frontal view. And it's cut right in the coronal plane. They cut right through the part where you have the external acoustic meatus. And what you learn from this picture of the ear are all the different parts of the ear, external, middle, and inner. In inner. your ear, what we call your ear. This is called the pina in anatomy. And there's different parts to it. I, I don't teach those parts. Um, so you know, the whole thing made out of cartilage is the pina. It, it helps funnel sound waves into um, external acoustic meatus, also considered part of external ear. external acoustic meatus, which has a ceruminous glands. Well, basically, cerumen is earwax. So earwax helps um, it's basically antimicrobial. Helps keep the bugs out of your ear. Okay. And also, um, that passageway, the external acoustic meatus, leads up to what's commonly known as your eardrum or tympanic membrane, which basically is the partition between <coughs> external ear and what's called the middle ear. So 
the middle ear is um, that membrane, tympanic membrane. And it's cut on the other side of it is this area known as the tympanic cavity of the middle ear. This little space right there. So the middle ear um, is receiving sound wave vibrations from the tympanic membrane. All the sound waves are funneled by the external acoustic meatus. <coughs> whatever, whatever the sound waves, um, their frequency and volume, they're, they're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane at, at a certain frequency. Okay? And it's the job of the tympanic membrane to pass along that sound wave energy to the auditory ossicles, which are contained within the tympanic cavity. Auditory ossicles. So, external acoustic meatus. Funnel sound waves. And the energy from those sound waves is going to vibrate tympanic membrane. sound wave energy <laughs> vibrates tympanic membrane. I use blue because it's sensory. This is the sensory information that will be conducted to the inner ear. Well, that sound wave energy needs to be amplified um, because the inner ear structure is filled with fluid. And fluid provides more resistance. So to stimulate the hair cells inside the inner ear, you need an amplification factor. And that's what the auditory ossicles do. It's the job of the auditory ossicles. They're, they, they're basically in contact with this membrane inside the tympanic um, cavity. And they will vibrate and amplify the sound wave energy. by a factor of 22. So remember that number. 22. So the sound wave energy is transferred um, to the inner ear by means of the auditory ossicles. inner ear um, receives sound wave energy. I mean, we're, there's a lot more details there. I don't want to get into it, but I'm just giving you an overview. The inner ear structure, you can kind of see it faded out right there. It's the cochlea, it's the vestibule, and it's three semicircular canals. So let me just write those terms on the board and we'll, out, we'll draw it out later. The inner ear structure is the cochlea, the vestibule, <coughs> and three semicircular canals. Okay, so right now I'll just kind of know that. And um, so that's basically the different regions of the ear, external, middle, and inner. Notice that the middle ear has this tube here called the auditory tube. I would note that. Continuous with 
auditory tube. The fancy name is pharyngotympanic because the pharynx is your throat. Okay. So this tube, basically, um, the idea is you have this tight membrane and you want the pressure to be equal on both sides. Okay. Like you ever drive up to the mountains and your ears get all plugged up? You want to pop them, kind of chew gum? Not like that, but opening your jaw helps to open this. When you drive up um, to the mountains, the air pressure differs because the air pressure is uh, decreasing as you go to altitude. And if there's a pressure differential, um, this will recess or be pushed one way or the other. So opening your mouth will equalize the pressure on both sides. Okay. For example, when you get sick and get all stuffed up, your ears get plugged up. This tube has a tendency to close up. But when it closes up, you trap the air that's inside the tympanic cavity. That air is absorbed by blood vessels here, so then there's less air, less pressure on this side of the membrane. So on this side of the membrane, there's more pressure, and that creates a force which causes the tympanic membrane to recess. And when it recesses, it doesn't conduct the sound wave energy as effectively. That's why it sounds like your ears are plugged up. Okay. But of course, that goes away if you equalize the pressure after you get well. And you know, that's why they have ear, nose, throat specialists, because that tube is connected to throat. And you can see here, it's connected to ear. It's also connected to the nose, because your nose and throat are connected. So that's how infection can spread. Okay. Um, let's take a closer look at that, uh, at those three auditory ossicles, malleus incus stapes. It's called the ossicular chain. So this is a close-up view of the middle ear. Okay. Do you ever hold your nose and blow to pop your ears? You should never do that. Because what are you doing? You're putting positive pressure, and that might be too power, you might hurt yourself. But if you just open and close your mouth and try to let it passively equalize, that's much safer. All right, so what you see there is that tympanic membrane right here at the end of the external acoustic meatus, the sound waves, bass, treble, or mid range is vibrating at, at the same frequency as all the sounds you're hearing. It really just kind of hugs on it. More or less, that bone, these are the auditory ossicles. That implies these are bones. I didn't teach them when I taught the skull, but I'm teaching them now. These are bones. So that first one is the malleus. It's connected with um, the incus. It's around there like that. And it's um, connected to this kind of or should be things called stapes. Stapes, spelled stapes, don't say stapes, say stapes, one of those weird anatomy things. Okay, so this is our tympanic membrane, or your eardrum. 
that's a layman's term called the tympanic membrane. But it is like a drum head, it's just vibrating. And as you can see, they're all connected to each other. So they're going to oscillate and amplify whatever sound wave energy that's absorbing and amplify by a factor of what? Yeah, I think that number's on the test. That's why I said no way. Uh, under the foot plate of stape, stapes. See, students have mispronounced it so often, I, I start mispronouncing it. You guys start to influence me. I'm influencing you, right? Stapes as the proper pronunciation. This actually, under the foot plate of stapes is a window called the oval window that's directly connect. that is a window on the inner ear structure. So I'm just trying to draw a little <laughs> dotted line here. A little uh, membrane. So on the other side of that window is a fluid column inside the inner ear structure that's going to transfer that sound wave energy. Imagine vibrating this water. Okay? And that water is going to vibrate the hair cells. So this lecture is really all about the hair cells. Get to those later. <coughs> Vibrate the hair cells, you get um, sensation from the cochlear branch or the vestibular branch. Uh, okay, so that's the base. What else do you got here? A couple muscles. Well, and a nerve. There's this nerve, facial nerve, running through this space here, the tympanic cavity. You see that, they call this the promontory, you don't have to know that. But that bulge is created by the first turn of the cochlea. The cochlea is like a snail shell. And um, basically that's it, that's the cochlea right on the other side. Right underneath that foot plate is the oval window. Okay. A couple of muscles here, you can see a tendon there and a tendon, little muscle cut there. Um, so the neck of malleus, right around here. Kind of, they kind of muscle away. That is the, the tensor tympani. <coughs> and you do see the tendon on the neck of stapes, right? That little white thing. That's a tendon of a muscle called um, stapedius. Stapedius. Those muscles, what they do is, um, these two muscles, boom, boom, they dampen, they dampen the ossicular chain during loud noises. Thunder, someone shouting. So you know, think of it. You don't want to like these to oscillate too much, and you don't want to, you don't want to rupture something, right? So they kind of dampen it, kind of a safety net. These are innervated by cranial nerve seven. And sometimes you get a palsy where that nerve becomes paralyzed, and maybe half of your face is paralyzed. Usually, it's temporary. Well, if you paralyze that and you paralyze the branches that innervate these muscles, and there's a term it's called hyper forget the term. Basically, your ears become oversensitive to loud noises. So normal noises may sound extremely loud because you don't have the ability to dampen the ossicular chain. So they're important. So know those two muscles, stapedius and tensor tympani. They're, they're not on the figure there, so that's why I wrote them on my board. So write them in your notes. It's a blank figure you can study. And here's basically explaining the ossicular chain. 
it transmits vibrations to the oval window right here for a total factor of amplification factor of 22. If the ossicular chain fails, the patient will experience conductive hearing loss, maybe a magnitude of 20 de decibels. To give you an idea of what decibels mean, they give you a, a sound range of, if, if you were to measure it in these locations, okay? The red zone, obviously, it can be harmful to hearing. You should wear ear protection. If you go to the gun range, bring earplugs. You're using a chainsaw or some of those headphones. And um, so loud noises can cause hearing loss, okay? You can rupture this. If it becomes perforated or ruptured, you inhibit the ability to amplify sound. That's the so-called conductive hearing loss. The most common cause is called otosclerosis, where you get a, these bony um, processes that form that cause the foot plate of stapes to be fused to the oval window, and it doesn't transfer the sound wave energy as effectively. So conductive hearing loss. The sound isn't conducted as well. The other main form of hearing loss is sense, sensory neuron. Where are these things? Conductive hearing loss. I said the most common cause is otosclerosis, where foot plate becomes fused to oval window. Uh, the other major kind of hearing loss is sensory neural. Okay, that one is more serious because somehow hair cells have been damaged and lost. You can't get those back. They don't regenerate for whatever reason. Hair cells, maybe they, a loud noise did it. Um, well, if the hair cells are damaged, you fail to stimulate the cochlear nerve, okay? And that kind of hearing loss. And, you know, there are things that can help. Hearing aids, which, um, well, you know, the first hearing aid was a big trumpet on your ear, right? To help funnel the sound for conducting hearing loss. So, you know, we go like this, right? You're, what are you doing? You're, you're helping to funnel the air. Um, so, modern hearing aids, they, they have a microphone and amplifier that helps amplify the sound to the inner ear structure, that you can wear it fit in. They can be completely inside the external acoustic apparatus. So there are many different choices there. Uh, cochlear implants, what they do is, the external part is a microphone, and they transfer, transfer the electrical impulses directly to the temporal bone to directly stimulate the cochlear nerve, since the hair cells aren't doing their job. However, that is not as effective as hair cells. The hair cells are the best, okay? All right, so here's a close-up view of how stapes should normally operate. It's a tilting action on that uh, column of fluid. Stapes tilts as it oscillates. So that's what you're being shown there. And you see the sound wave energy being transferred to the column of fluid on the other side of it. Oval window, stapes tilts, sound wave energy transferred to the fluid. Okay, the hair cells should be on this Basler membrane. We'll get more into that later. But here's a clip just to basically narrow down there. The, the tilting, okay, and you're kind of like off this red dotted line, but that's kind of what you're looking for there for the normal operation of stapes. 
<clears throat> All right, so for the inner ear structure, we looked at it earlier. It's inside the temporal bone. I want to skip a couple of figures. I'll come back to these. But I want to use this to teach you the general structure of the inner ear. It's got the hair cells. So when you study the inner ear structure, ask yourself one question. Where are the hair cells? And if you know the answer to that question, you're off to a good start in your study. general organ organization is that you have bone called a bony labyrinth that surrounds a membranous labyrinth. So if I were to simplify it to that shape there, kind of round shape, you know, call that bone, bony labyrinth. It surrounds a membranous labyrinth. colored in blue. <coughs> and they're all fluid filled. The bony labyrinth is filled with a fluid called perilymph. <coughs> fluid called perilymph. And then the membranous labyrinth is filled with a fluid called endolymph. Basically, these fluids are like plasma or saline. The biological fluids, so perilymph, endolymph, okay? That's the general pattern there. Um, however, if I were to draw this whole thing, <laughs> uh, it's a little more complicated. practice drawing this. Oh, let me do one more turn there. Okay, start with that. I'll use black for bony labyrinth. Um, and for the membranous labyrinth, I'll use blue like it's blue on the picture there. So notice that the membranous labyrinth in this part here called the cochlea, it spirals within it. Sometimes it helps to draw it to know it. You don't have to draw it. But for those of you where it helps to draw it, draw it. Because the names of the parts, you got to get solidified in your head. Um, well, anyways, that membranous labyrinth is connected to this part here in the vestibule. That's um, saccule and ventricle, these <coughs> sacs of endolymph. I'll draw one sac, and I'll draw this other sac. Okay, I'll label them later. I just want to kind of get the outline first. And so you got these two sacs, one, two. But there's like three other sacs that it's continuous with. I'll draw them as little ampules or bulbs. So I tried to draw these two sacs and these three other sacs because they all contain hair cells. Now, to finish it off, I have to draw these three 
um, kind of as semicircular canals because they kind of like completely form these semicircles. Good enough. I tried to draw three. The reason why you need three for balance and equilibrium is because you live in three-dimensional space, and one for each x, y, z axis in three-dimensional space. Now let me try to encase this in bone. shell part, cochlea, this part here. Okay. And again, where in the world are the hair cells? In the cochlea, there's a structure called organ accordion. They draw it as a line right along the um, membranous labyrinth there. So I'm not going to draw the hair cells in it, but it's just basically uh, along here. This is the organ of Cordy. This red line all the way in. This part here, on my picture, uh, it's vestibule. Now the vestibule contains utricle and saccule. Structures that contain the hair cells are called macula. Uh, so I'll just draw something that's red in there. So each of these have a structure called macula. That is the structure that has the hair cells. Everything in red has the hair cells. Now you have three semicircular canals. And um, okay, at the base where it's all kind of dilated. That's called the ampulla of the semicircular canal. Let me, draw, let me draw one separate. It's kind of hard to tell from the picture. Let me draw the blue part first. Membranous labyrinth surrounded by a bony labyrinth. Okay, the part that's distended is the ampulla. So in your three semicircular canals, <coughs> pay attention to the ampulla because it has a structure. It's too hard to draw in there. It's going to be inside there. called the Crista Ampularis. I'll just kind of mix it here. And 
and it's the crista ampullaris of the ampulla that has the hair cells. Saccule as spaces that contain the macula. The macula is a structure within them. Yeah. Let me check and make sure I didn't misspell ampulae. Oh, yeah, it's a double L. So it's a double L for ampulae. Sorry about that. Ampularis, double L. That didn't look right. And Okay, the crista ampullaris is stimulated by a structure called cupula. Put that in parentheses. Cupula. The macula, those hair cells, are stimulated by these little rock crystals called otoliths. Otoliths. And we'll look at pictures of all these later. I'm just giving you an overview now. But um, these are words where if you didn't study them, you'll be clueless. Uh, there's a lot of words for this. Okay. So we've got vestibule, and these are our three semicircular canals. And that's basically the inner ear. So I want to go back to those pictures that I skipped. But is there any questions on this? Yeah. Can hurt what? Your, your inner ear hair. Well, if it's too loud. The hair cells are inside here, but these are in the external ear. So if the volume's too loud, you could damage it. Yeah. It's all, it's all about the volume of the music you listen to. Uh, have you experienced something called tinnitus, where you have ringing in your ears when there's no noise? That means you pop, it's a symptom that you have damage to uh, hair cells. Okay, so that's something to look for if you're worried about that. Okay. All right, so I did skip. Oh, so we started here, and I showed you this picture. This is an interesting picture. If you were like to kind of like scoop out some bone and like take a section of the cochlea, you could kind of see what it looks like in cross section by this little picture here. So what they did was they just scoop out a little bone, but in taking out part of the cochlea, you see this arrangement there. Yeah. Let's talk about cochlea first. So what you see there, um, you, you kind of see the arrangement of, well, I haven't taught that yet. Let me just kind of draw what you see there. Something like that. It's the cochlea, the cross section. And you see within each little of these six segments, it's divided up into little chambers. And we're going to learn what those little chambers are. And actually, the whole endolymph perilymph thing, the middle chamber is where the endolymph is, basically. So I'll draw blue. It's membranous labyrinth. 
that's where the hair cells are in that middle chamber there. And so you expect to see a branch of the cochlear nerve come out of there. So these are all branches of the cochlear nerve. Cochlear branch. Okay, that's part of cranial nerve eight. So, anyways, we're we're going to learn uh, the details of that cross-sectional view. So, here's a picture showing both branches. Um, I drew one branch, the cochlear branch. What's the other branch coming from all these structures there? the vestibular branch, okay? There's some coming from the vestibule, and there's some coming from the three semicircular canals. Notice that, I didn't really draw it this way, there's branches all along the organ accordion, all along it. All those branches converge into the uh, cochlear branch. So there's hair cells galore in the organ accordion. Let's talk about that. So let's, um, this picture kind of shows you if you were to unroll the cochlea, which you can't do, but just hypothetically, if you were to unroll it, slice it, and look at that cross-sectional view, you know, get one of these, we have a model of this. It's one of our new green boards back there. It's got this on it. Anyways, here's the picture you should study. Okay, so uh, this is one of those chambers, right, of the six that we drew here. And uh, these are the details you need to know. Cochlear cross section. that's what you got. Okay, these three areas. Top and bottom are filled with perilymph and the names are scala vista, scala vis, uh, I can't even say it. Let's see if I can write it. Scala vestibu um, vestibuli or vestibular duct. Vestibuli. Oh, I'm glad this is the last lecture. <laughs> I can barely get the words out. Or call it vestibular duct. I'll put SV up here. That, that, it's that top one. Okay. Scala media or cochlear duct, it's got the hair cells. I'll put a little SM here. And then the bottom one is the uh, scala tympani. So ST for short. So top and bottom, perilymph, endolymph in the middle there. There's two important membranes to learn in the uh, scala media. There's this one on the bottom. Uh, let me advance the slide. Here, let's get to this close up view. Um, a more floppy or less floppy basilar membrane, you've got the hair cells in the middle, and at the top membrane you have the, a stiff tectorial membrane. So you have a floppy basilar membrane at the bottom there.
So we'll call this organ of cornea. The structure that has the hair cells. And we're within scala media. Okay, so know that basilar membrane, I use green. It's, I say it's floppy. You can deflect it. The sound wave energy can deflect it. And when you do that, you stimulate the hair cells, depending on which part of the cochlea you're, you're at. I'll say can deflect. You notice you have all these hair cells there. You have the inner ones, you have the outer ones. Oh, you can see it there. and uh, some outer ones. They sit on top of the basilar membrane. in there somehow with the tissue. So inner and outer hair cells. So the inner ones I drew red. Turns out the inner ones conduct something like 95% of the sound signals. Okay, so I guess they're more important, right? Uh, the outer hair cells, the rest of it. Well, anyways, on top of the um, hairs of the hair cells is a stiff pectoral membrane. Tectorial membrane. I say it's uh, it's more stiff. So that when you deflect the basilar membrane, the stiff pectoral membrane, um, as the hairs move and the bottom one's shaken, you stimulate the hair bundle that's on the top. That physical moving of the hair bundle, they call it mechanical transduction. You turn on uh, the cell and you're, 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 you're going to stimulate the nerve fibers. So you see these hair cells has got a hookup. be all branches of the, the cochlear branch of cranial nerve 8. Okay? So that's the organ accordi. Two membranes. It's basically a hair cell sandwich, is how I like to call it. Well, here's a real picture. Or here's a blank picture. Here's a real picture of uh, inner, outer hair cells. See the numbers there? About 3,500 hair cells that are the inner hair cells and about 16,000 outer hair cells. They the inner hair cells they transduce sound about 95%, whereas the um, active movements of outer hair, outer hair cells amplify the signal. Okay. Well, let's talk about sound wave energy itself. Sound is a form of energy. There's the old question, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a noise? Yes. Okay. And it depends if there's anyone there to hear it. Okay, the sound wave energy is there. They, they give the example here, if you strike a tuning fork, you can see like um, the sound, the air, air molecules, you know, from the sound of the tuning fork there. And uh, we have these in lab, maybe we should get them out so you can play with them. You hear different tones. And um, sound wave is described as, well you should understand, the wavelength and the amplitude. Any questions on organ of cordy? Yes. Yeah. In, in a sound, uh, is 
No, spell it out. I just did, yeah. That's a shortcut I will not allow. Although, it's multiple choice, right? Yeah, okay. Yay, multiple choice. Yeah, you guys love that. Uh, okay, so sound waves, I need to know. Uh, so it's wavelength. Well, they give you a red and a blue sound. Um, okay, just look, you look at this. You tell me which. Wavelength is shorter, the red or the blue? The red. The red. Okay, and how we perceive that is a higher pitch, like treble. Okay, um, so if the sound uh, wavelength is shorter, it has a higher frequency. Frequency, I know you probably haven't had physics. Anyone have physics? You should all take a year of physics. Uh, just because. Anyways, what you would learn is that Hertz is a, it's, it's a frequency, it's a unit of time. It's like how many sound waves pass a fixed point per second. Okay. Waves per second, some unit time. So if they if there's Sound waves, well, the wavelength is shorter. More is going to pass a fixed point per second. And we perceive it as a higher pitch. So basically, it stands to reason. It's longer, lower frequency, uh, bass, something low. When I put together my home theater system, I bought two subwoofers. I like bass. <clears throat> okay, anyways, getting back to this. When you buy headphones, someone asked about headphones. Uh, the human hearing range is like 20 to 20,000 hertz. So when you look at the technical specs on the back, it should tell you that. So it should be, most good headphones have that range. Not that you could really hear the whole range, but the music should be produced in a way whereas the headphones that you play it on, you want to be able to hear it. Um, for example, if you buy headphones, cheaper headphones that don't go that low, but the music was produced that way, it'll just sound distorted in your headphones. It won't sound very good. Okay, so anyways, for wavelength, frequency, hertz, pitch, right? For um, amplitude, it's just loudness. The volume knob. You know, louder, softer. So that's the whole decibel thing that I mentioned earlier. Here's a longitudinal view of the cochlea to illustrate pitch discrimination. Cochlea, we got there, so it looks like you got. Don't think they put this here. And the hair cell's going to be on this middle one here. Then you got a hair cell here. 
Then you got a hair cell here. They're all long. I'm just going to draw a few locations there for the hair cell at the end. But you have the hair cells in the um, organ of cordy and the scale of media. Top and bottom would be a uh, stipular duct here. or scala vestibuli. This one here is the tympanic duct. And basically, what, what, what you see here that you didn't see before is, do you see how vestibular duct and tympanic duct are continuous with each other? You can go all, so, so like, okay, let me explain it this way. Uh, stapes oval window are right here. They communicate with scala vestibuli. So pretend you have a foot plate of stapes. And it's going to bulge that oval window right here. It's going to tilt and bulge that oval window. And when it, I mean, it bulges it, but it's, it's oscillating, right? It's like, it's like, right? It's vibrating it. And it vibrates the column of fluid. And that sound wave energy is pushing and vibrating the fluid in the vestibular duct, OK? Um, the thing is, if you push in there, you have to push out here. This window is called the round window. Because it's all filled with fluid. So if one bulges in, one has to bulge out. Because it's all filled with fluid. And so whatever sound you're hearing, multiple sounds, it's like bulging. As this goes in, this goes out, and you just kind of like the sound wave energy dampens as the sound dis dissipates. But what you got to understand is that sound wave energy, whatever it is, um, what you should know about basilar membrane, on this picture I drew it black, they, they, they rest on the basilar membrane. And this figure is always accompanied with like, they always like illustrate this. There are fibers that stabilize the, the basilar membrane. The fiber length associated with the basilar membrane, they're longer or shorter. They're shorter or closer to the oval window. Okay, so imagine these are into, these represent fiber lengths, they're really long here. A longer fiber of the basilar membrane makes it um, easier to deflect. So it takes less sound wave energy to deflect it over here. Longer fibers, easier to deflect. Basically, takes less sound wave takes less sound wave energy to deflect. You, know, you walk around along the spectrum, the shorter fibers are more difficult to deflect. They're shorter and stronger. So it's more stiff on this end, it's more floppy on that end. Okay. It's more stiff. It's hard to deflect. So it's going to take more energy, more sound wave energy to deflect hair cells on this side. It takes more sound wave energy to deflect on this end. Okay, so basically, uh, the reason why I'm saying this, I put some numbers there, I think they did 16,000, 6,000, 1,000. 16. Those are hertz, right?
and how we perceive that sound wave energy is treble, high pitches, uh, mid-range, more here, and bass down here. But it's a physical stimulation of the hair cells. So um, let's say you're listening to music and it's somewhere around 1,000. <coughs> So um, a thousand hertz comes in. That energy from a thousand, it's traveling along. It's looking for the first place I can push down and deflect that middle frame. It's like twanging a rubber band. You know, at what point can I twang it? It goes to here a thousand, but it takes sixteen thousand to deflect there. So it can't. So it just keeps going. It's looking for the path of least resistance. It gets to here. Uh, can you deflect here, yes or no? Yes or no? What do you think? No. It's only 1,000. It takes 6,000 to deflect here. You can deflect here. So you know, you kind of like twang the rubber band there. It kind of deflects, you know, you move it at that, at that particular part. So you move those hair cells. Those hair cells are wired to hear bass. Okay. Uh, what if it's like, what if it's like five? And it's not enough sound wave energy to deflect anything. What happens? It just keeps traveling and traveling. It goes all the way around the bend and just goes out to the round window. The round window is like a, it's like a doormat. It just kind of absorbs the sound wave energy. So do you hear the five? Can you perceive it? No, it's outside your range. You don't have the hair cell for it. Okay. Um, so the genius of this is that it's set up this way, where high energy on one end, where sounds coming in, and low energy over here. So that way, um, let's say you actually have a high pitch sound. Okay. You know, hit that high note. It's gonna immediately come in and deflect. Okay. Therefore, you only hear this tone. Do you hear any of the other tones? No. Because they're not stimulated. The sound wave energy deflected there and went right back out. Okay, so that's kind of what they're showing there. And what I like about this figure is as you deflect down, so you're pushing in here, sound wave energy deflects there. You see how round window bulges out as this bulges in? And as it deflects up, like twanging a rubber band, it, it's reverse. Okay? So those windows, they just kind of like, they just kind of oscillate with each other. You can hear the sound. Now, I had a free hearing test on here just to give you an idea of what that is. Uh, it didn't work. It worked yesterday on my iPad. It didn't work on this computer. I found another one. Give me a second to cue this up. That's 40 decibels. If you heard that sound, that sound was 500. So what does that mean on my diagram here? Which hair cells were being stimulated? The ones closer to here or the ones down there? The ones down there, OK, these weren't stimulated at all. And it kind of plays it at lower decibels. I'm not really concerned with that. That's 500 hertz at 50 decibels. I'll, I'll say we can hear it. I want to get a different tone. That's 1,000 hertz. Can anyone hear that? Some, some of you can. So it's a higher tone. So if 500 was here, 1,000, you're moving up right, with a higher tone.
That's 1,000 hertz at 30 decibels. Here's 4,000. Can anyone hear that? It's very high. So that hertz, you know, is somewhere higher. You just keep going, okay? Um, with age, with normal hearing and normal aging, um, you, you lose the high end, okay? So uh, I found a cool brain games. What they did was they had an audience. They had everyone with a sticker with their age on it. And they played all these test tones. And they said, if you could hear it, raise your hand. And as they played the higher and the higher and higher tones, the older people started putting their hands down. I like it because there's a guy who's 46. I'm 46. I want to see if I matched him. Uh, okay, well, let's see if um, we can kind of get this here. Let me do this. We've gathered a group of volunteers ranging in ages from 8 to 71 and are putting them to the test in our first Battle of the Ages contest. All right, you guys, I'm going to play a series of sounds. And if you can hear the sound, I want you all to raise your hands up. Your right hand, you're going to keep it there, all right? For those of you watching at home, feel free to play along. Ready? 8,000 hertz. All right. All of you can hear that first frequency. Now I'm going to play another sound at another frequency. If you still hear it, keep your hands up. If you can't, bring your hand down. 10,000 hertz. Okay, we seem to have lost our 16 over crowd. You guys look great though. <laughs> Let's raise the frequency even more. 14,000 hertz. Okay, we lost you, we lost you. Very fit, I can tell. 16,000 hertz. Okay, at 16,000 hertz, we've lost all of our grown-ups. But we still have our youngest members of the crowd with their hands up. Luke, tell everybody how old you are. Eight. Eight years old. Fresh ears. Still can pick up these faint frequencies. I've been cleaning. <laughs> nice work. Now we're taking it up to 18,000 hertz. You guys ready? 18,000 hertz. We've lost 23 and 19. But the under 18 crowd is intact. 18,000 hertz. That's pretty impressive. Enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> so, how about you at home? Were you able to pick up that final tone? Or were you left listening to the sound of silence? Well, either way, you may have noticed a trend. As this chart shows, the higher the frequency, the younger you typically have to be to hear that sound. So why is that the case? And what does it have to do with your brain? To help answer that, here's Yale University's Brian Scholl. Sounds out in the world are just vibrations in the air. But what we hear is determined by patterns of neurons firing in our brains. So the first step in hearing a sound is to somehow translate an air vibration into an electrical neural signal. This is done by microscopic hair cells in our ears Different hair cells are activated by different frequencies of vibrations in the air. But as we age, these hair cells start to deteriorate so that we gradually lose the ability to hear these frequencies. What? And who knows? You All right. Good point there. So it's pretty accurate where, you know, the hair, hair cell loss due to age. six-year-old contestant. I couldn't hear it at 16. I thought I could, but it is too slight for me to keep my hand up. Here's what I drew before. The apex, it's floppy. The, the, the fibers are longer, okay? And the frequency down to 20 there, um, the hair cells there would be stimulated. Okay, but as you go higher, <coughs> medium frequencies, high frequencies, um, you get closer and closer to the oval window. So that is an unrolled cochlea. Remember, it's really a spiral inside the uh, inner ear structure. Let's see. Here. 
Here, here's a stepwise process that um, the brain games showed a nice diagram of this. I thought that was better. But here's the figure from your book. You should kind of know the order. First, you vibrate. What is that? Tympanic membrane. Which window is that? Under the foot plate of stapes. Oval. Oval. You transfer to this duct, vestibular duct, scalar vestibuli. You travel along till the sound wave energy can deflect the hair cells in the organ of cordy. And the sound wave energy travels out the tympanic duct. And what's the doormat window here? Round. So oval and round. Don't confuse those. Uh, the order of steps. Let's move on from cochlea to the vestibular apparatus. When we draw, drew it out earlier, I gave you, well, U and S, that's utricle, saccule. And inside there are the macula. These are for different sensations. Cochlea is sound. This is um, linear acceleration. You're in your car, 0 to 50, 0 to 70. You, you can feel that linear self acceleration. The big drop on a roller coaster, a okay, linear acceleration. That's what this conveys. So uh, linear acceleration, if you study the macula inside there, vestibule, inside that bony chamber is utricle and saccule, and inside there, each of them is macula. I put AE because it pluralizes if there's one in each one. So you, you, you see this arrangement. And do, do you see the hair cells? Do you see the hair cells? They're right there. Okay. Now you have this membrane called the otolith. Basically, they're rock crystals, and um, you can see how they're they're at the top of the hair cell bundle. So it's like if you have a hair cell, and the hair cell bundle is embedded in an otolithic membrane. With all these rock crystals on top. Otolithic membrane. If you accelerate, if you tilt your head, the rock crystals move according to how you tilt your head from side to side, you know, um, or accelerate in the car. And it stimulates the hair cells as such, conveying the sensation of linear acceleration. head tilt. In the other region, the vestibular apparatus at the base of each semicircular canal is an ampulla.
So SC is semi circular canal. Remember when I drew it earlier, the ampulla is the base. Ampulla has a descent structure called crista ampullaris. And I said earlier, it is stimulated by a cupula. We'll get to a picture of it. But anyways, I just wanted to get those terms introduced. Here's a picture of the ampulla. Okay. So we're only looking at the end of it. So the whole semicircular canal, what I drew earlier, is like that. But this is only the ampulla. And what you see there in the ampulla you see hair cells. We have an epithelial membrane right here. Okay, so there's more epithelia around it. These are all cells, but the hair cells are the important one, and um, because they are hooked up to the vestibular branch of cranial nerve eight, so they do show those nerve fibers exiting there. And when I said earlier, it's stimulated by a cupula, which kind of looks like a lava lamp. And when the cupula is deflected one way or the other, the hair cells inside will be stimulated. Okay, so this is the crista ampullaris here. That's the structure with the hair cells. Okay. Now these canals, because it's a whole half circle and it's all fluid filled, they sense rotational acceleration. Because when you rotate, you would move the fluid inside a half circle. Okay. So they detect rotational acceleration. I can't handle this kind. I mean, teacups at Disneyland, merry-go-round. I get dizzy. I can't handle this one. Uh, so I know I can never be a fighter pilot, I guess. Uh, the hair cells look like this, and they have some structure, okay? And I've been drawing them kind of this way. You need to distinguish that tall hair cell called the kinocilium from the other ones, stereocilia. The hair cell has channels directly gated by mechanical stimuli, mechanical transduction. When you stimulate the hairs of the cell, you depolarize it, okay? So the stereocilia, well, let me show you better pictures. These are real pictures. Here's the hair cell, nucleus, hair bundle up here, kind of looks like a mohawk. There's a superior beard just showing the hairs. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me draw this right there. That's the kinocilium, the tall hair bundle. And the rest of the hair bundle are stereocilia. They kind of look like just vertical lines. cell, the stereocilia, the kinocilium. And this has been studied. Um, I included one figure from the studies of Hudspeth and Corey. 
their studies utilize the saccule from bullfrog. It's done in the 70s. Frog. See what they did? They removed the otolithic membrane and they allowed them to put their glass electrode um, in a way where they could <coughs> wiggle the hair bundle. So they stimulated the hair bundle from the exposed hair cells and what they recorded was this kind of depolarization, uh, repolarization when you move the hair bundle. It was directional sensitive. If you moved it one way, it depolarized. If you move it the other way, it hyperpolarized. So here's a close up picture of that. It's called the tip lengths hypothesis. Well, anyways, this hypothesis, I think, is widely accepted now, is that the hairs are actually connected. There's um, protein-like things that actually connect the hair tips. And tip links say, if you stretch the tip links, so if you move it in a way that stretches the tip links, it produces the inward currents, the depolarization. If you move in the opposite way, where the tip links are slackened, that's inhibition. So stretch depole, slackened, repole. So that's how the hair cells work. All the hair cells, not just the ones from the saccule. Okay, the tip links. So, um, that had been said, here is the otolithic membrane detecting head tilt. You tilt it one way or the other way, and then they show the, the active potentials firing if the tip links are stretched or slackened. The otoliths are, they respond to gravity. Okay, so if you ever get a chance to experience zero G, you might get nauseous for a while, because the, the otoliths are like floating. They're not settling down and stimulating the hair cells. Here's the rotational acceleration in the semicircular canal. They give the example of the figure skater uh, spinning. Well, they start with before she spins. But as you begin to spin and rotate, the fluid inside has inertia. So as you spin, the, the cupula is deflected, stimulating the hair cells for stretching the tip lengths. When you stop, <coughs> I mean, the fluid will move in the other way because it's still moving the opposite way from when you're spinning because the, the inertial forces of fluid itself. And that's easy to see, though. You spin and stop spinning and the sensation that you feel. So anyways, that's rotational acceleration. All right. So I'd like to take a break now. But uh, basically, um, I'm done with lecture. Hooray.